and inclusion within the interior design industry. And we have a program of mentoring, apprenticeship schemes, uh, we have um, schools outreach um, and lots of other things, a resource hub as a one stop shop for people wanting to get into the design industry and opening that door and giving a level playing field and pathway to people from ethnic minority backgrounds um, and those that are socially economically disadvantaged in order to gain access to the industry. Um, now we start with Anika Khan. Uh, Anika is the entrepreneur behind ePorter. Uh, the world's most powerful interior projects tool. From searching and sourcing to purchasing and project management, ePorter saves designers time, money and hassle when bringing any interior space to life. ePorter powers great interior design. Born and raised in Manchester, Anika graduated from Oxford University, achieving a master's degree in politics, philosophy and economics. She began her career in private equity investment, working for Guy Hans at the age of 21 um, and joining CVC Capital Partners three years later. Uh, for both companies, she broke new ground as the youngest hire. Although born in the UK, Anika has grown up with a mixed heritage uh, from India, Iran, Yemen and East Africa. This unique history has inspired her passion for business on a global scale. In January of 2014, she became strategy director and head of IPO at the UK's leading property website, Zoopla, successfully leading the company's IPO to achieve a billion on exit. E Porter draws on Anika's significant experience at Zoopla, her understanding of technology as a business enabler, and her passion for interiors to create a fresh and better way for this community to do business online. Welcome, Anika. Thank you. It's a very, very long um, bio. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, on to Amma. Amma Afrifa Chi uh, is the Head of Culture and Wellbeing at Mental Health First Aid England and is also the founder of the Inclusion Agilist. Amma is a valiant cultural builder whose specialism spans across people, experience, workplace culture, diversity and inclusion, mental health and well-being, and corporate responsibility. She is experienced in leading the design, analysis and implementation of people-centric products, services, inclusion and well-being initiatives. She works with senior leadership, management teams and employment engagement to embed and integrate organizational culture through behavior, processes and symptoms and seeks to promote a positive, inclusive and supportive work environment and co company culture by developing and evolving programs and initiatives that support the organization's missions and values. Amma has built her career and expertise, over 14 years of expertise, with different industries such as startups, tech, professional services, legal, financial services, media and entertainment. Amma has an LLB in law and an MA in public relations and public communications. She is a fellow of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Art, Manufacturers and Commerce in the UK, a trustee of Artswork, a governor on the board of the Boxing Academy and the former mentoring chair of women in cable and telecommunications. Very busy lady indeed. <laughs> And then we have um, designer Avin Taylor, uh, winner of the 2019 Evening Standard Home Design Award. Avin Taylor's design are notable for their inspirational use of colour and pattern. He is passionate, a passionate believer in the importance of the client brief and taking time to understand a client's individual needs. From an Indian background, one of his concerns is that borrowing aesthetics from a range of cultures is masking the lack of diversity, of racial diversity in the interior design industry. Thank you, Bavin. And then Julia Begbie. Starting her career working in finance in the city in the 1980s before retraining in interior design in the late 90s, she has been, she has uh, she has since combined design practice with design education, most notably specialising in online education on behalf of KLC. She is currently overseeing the KLC Grand Design Scholarship Competition, having previously worked with local schools in London to try to encourage interest and widen participation in design education. 
This was part of a joint initiative with the local council's um, AIM Higher initiative. So now everybody's been welcomed, we shall begin with a series of questions um, which we will present to the panel. And this is also an interactive webinar chat as well. So there will be some questions that we'll be um, sort of posing to the audience and you will have the opportunity to um, sort of respond and then the panel um, we can sort of have a look through some of those responses uh, so please do get involved um, so diversity how do we panel define diversity this is not just about race you know this is about uh, age sex gender class disability religion you know, it's quite a complex subject. So I'll come to Baldwin first. Um, you are uh, a male uh, within. Am, yes. <laughs> you are pointing out the obvious. Thank um, you. <laughs> in amongst us, you know, we're 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 a female heavy um sort of panel here, and this is quite a you know female dominated industry. How have you found that journey for yourself? Um, as you said, it is definitely a female orientated industry. It was apparent as soon as I entered, you know, I went to KLC a long while ago now, um, and I was the only boy in the class. Um, and I do remember the, my tutor at the time coming up to me going, I'm so glad you're here, <laughs> because he was a guy as well. <laughs> um, so I've kind of known from like day one that I'm gonna stand out. Luckily, I don't have a problem with that. Um, people do, whether you're male or female, um, and to be honest, it shouldn't really matter what sex, gender you are, you know, if you're good at something, do it. And don't worry about standing out in a crowd, don't worry about people not looking like you, um, and just kind of be who you are and own it, really. Perfect. Thank you. And Anika, you know, you are... Um a lady, a woman in the uh, tech industry, which I can imagine is, you know, really sort of heavily male dominated. How have you found your journey um, to where you are today at Sea Porter? How has that journey been for you? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because um, we, we are the on the intersection of technology and design. So we, we kind of see both sides um, in terms of the the various aspects of diversity and how it manifests itself. I mean, tech, tech, the tech industry is notoriously very male driven in particular. Um, founders of tech businesses are um, you know, engineers, so people who are building the technology. You know, there's, there's a big difference in terms of um, socioeconomic group on that and then also obviously gender. And I think that over time, I've been running ePorter for about five years now. And I think over time it's got easier but, you know, pitching venture capitalists for money and being a woman who, you know, is younger as well than most people who are pitching was very difficult to do. I don't think I've ever pitched a, a woman in my five years of, you know, going around and meeting people, which is kind of insane. Um, but it just is, you know, the industry that we live in. Um, and so I think over time, it's definitely got easier. Um, but, but it's still a challenge, right? And I think it's a challenge for, to your point, like, what is diversity? Um, and what does it mean to be diverse? I think it's you're, you're different from the group, right? You're the person that stands out. So to your point, Bavin, you're, you're the only boy in class. You're, you're the diverse person in class. Um, mm -hmm. For me, when I'm in my, my tech industry piece, I'm the diverse um, individual within a founders group. But then, you know, with the interior design world, I'm less diverse. Um, so I think it just, it, it's a moving part. And so it's something that, you know, one of them, um, something really intuitive that one of them, our team said the other day was that it's, you can be diverse and non-diverse in different settings and that's okay. And it's just about being very conscious of, you know, what setting you're in and who else is there and, and um, what that means for them and for you within each. Perfect. Um, and Amma, you know, why is it important that we see diversity in the workplace and in industry generally? I think, well, it is important. And I think to, well, if I, well, I think what I heard the other day was really good by one of our chairs who actually really defined what diversity was. And diversity is a fact. As we sit here in Zoom and look around the screen, we have a diverse, a diverse group of people sitting here. You know, inclusion is a choice. 
So the diverse, but you need to have that diversity to make that choice. And I think it's really important because if we truly want to serve the communities that we are serving from a business perspective and truly reflect whether it's building products, whether it's design, whatever it is, it has to come from a place of a diverse perspective in order to um, service the population that it's being sold to or being pitched at. Um, so that it's fundamentally important because otherwise what happens is you create a whatever the item product or whatever might be or service predominantly just for one group and by doing that you isolate others um, and also I think you know the great thing about having diversity there's lots of research out there especially the McKinsey research that even shows that companies that have diverse workforces from an ethnicity perspective are 35 more likely to outgrow and outperform their competitors. 15% if they had a good mix of gender as well. So it is profitable and makes business sense to have a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And also if you want to be sustainable, but also still, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Relevant mm -hmm. <laughs> in the future of, and today's world with you know, economies of scale, with markets, new markets opening, just the whole globalization of things, you just being the opposite is not going to help your business or grow your business. Completely, definitely. And actually touching on, on the point that you just made about reaching you know, wide cultural sort of markets, the next sort of thing we're gonna to touch on is encouraging and supporting a transparent and diverse design community. So in order to really encourage diversity within practice, we kind of need to be looking at our end user as well. So in my personal experience, I don't actually design for many black people. I don't really design for many Asian people. You know, predominantly I work with white middle to upper class people because they are, that is the demographic that tends to use interior design and thinks interior design is for them. So I'm just wondering, you know, how do we promote interior design to those cultures as an end user? What do they need to see in order to, to think that that is for them? They need to see them in, in what you're producing. I think, you know, I, so I reupholster lampshades. That's my, I love that. Like I do love interior design. I love walking into a room and being able to see a space. My the thing is, is it's a human element. So obviously people have houses, people rent out and rent flats, you know, people wear clothes. And what they want to see is something that amplifies the identity of who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, and I reupholster lampshades specifically with African material because that is my heritage, but also the bold, beautiful colors are beautiful in any household and bring character to any household. So it's about learning about the beauty behind cultures to rep be represented. So it's interior design is not just for middle-class white people. Yes, they might be able to afford the high end. But that's another point it comes to. It's again, pitching yourself at levels where it's affordable for all. So you can have it for your high end stakes, but also for an affordability state. The question is, is, well, actually, when you are thinking, are you truly thinking about the end users? You really have to go on Instagram and Google interior designers or, you know, um, fashion, um, I guess, outlets or whatever, uh, designers, and you will see prefer about it. Even if you Google, you know, black designers or, you know, ethnic designers, so much stuff comes up, you know, and I think the beauty of it is with specific groups and especially targeting more so um, ethnic diverse designers is the story behind their art is formidable like you know it's almost like their art tells the story about who they are where they come from what the identity what they resonate with mm -hmm. and you know ultimately you want to be able to tell when people come into your home and see something that is really you know different oh where'd you get that from that starts the story that creates more education and more learning you grow through that so I think you know there is definitely ways to do it. And I think now that we have social media, I think going out of your comfort zone and thinking about, okay, well, who can I ask and target? Who do I know that um, specifically, there are actually agencies that specifically help promote and design things 
from a um, cultural perspective and also a diverse perspective. You know, in this day and age, there are so many new up and coming entrepreneurs that are seeing and who also are entrepreneurs from ethnic backgrounds who are seeing opportunities to reach out to that market. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, so I'll, I'll stop now because I do love to waffle. <laughs> one of the things that I, one of the things that I also realize is that there is this myth that not only can you not find um, diverse ethnic background designers out there, but also people from diverse back, uh, backgrounds can't afford it. That is a huge myth. If you and I can't remember the numbers, but the disposable income from ethnic background, my um ethnic background diverse groups is huge Mm -hmm. and if you think about 13.3 percent and i'm just saying this from represent uk are from ethnic backgrounds that's 13 and that's a considerable amount of people and that's coming from the consensus the uk consensus that's a considerable amount of people that you are missing out on as part of not only producing your product but also getting profit back from so it's not rocket science so from an interior designer spec, uh, perspective then, Bavin, how do you think we as designers could promote and encourage interior design to a more ethnically diverse end user as, from a business perspective? Um, well, I think it's more that we need to be seen and heard more. You know, okay. it's all very well that we run our businesses and we're out on Instagram and all of that, but if we're not being seen in a big scale, then people from ethnic or colored backgrounds are not gonna relate. So when I grew up, you know, even to this day, watching interior design shows, all the designers were white-faced. And unfortunately, apart from one mixed race um, presenter now, it's still the case. And that is how we can reach a wider audience if people like myself or others start stepping forward to be on these shows or actually get hired on these shows because that is the easiest platform to educate everyone because everyone watches those shows you know everyone's seen changing rooms everyone watched you know design masters and all of that so if like our parents back in the day had seen that look there's a colored person on TV or there's an ethnic person on TV or there's a male ethnic colored person on TV, they would understand that a creative industry is okay to be a part of. You can be successful in it. You know, we don't have to all be doctors, lawyers and all those kind of things, which I know I'm definitely never going to be in that world. So coming from like an Indian background, our parents want us to have like a secure job. But the reason they're not seeing design as a secure job because they're not seeing people who look like us on TV, let alone magazines or anything, you know? And I kind of feel as well, magazines have their role to play as well because we all get our work published in the magazines, but all the magazines care about is who lives in those houses. We get, if we're lucky, our name in it. And I don't think that's good enough. In this day and age, the designer needs to be brought to the front and magazines, major TV broadcasters, major producers, they've all got a responsibility now to step up because I've been speaking to multiple producers and TV uh, opportunities over the quite a few years now. And still to this day, you know, I get really close to being right in the final point of actually getting there. And then somebody kind of shuts it down. And then you start questioning, is it the color of my skin? Is it because I'm a guy? Um, Is my design too much? But I don't think, you know, saying any of those is okay now. These Mm. people have to do their jobs and put us out there. And it's as simple as that, really. Indeed. And just um, a quick question to the audience then. So... Within design, how do you think we could encourage a more diverse customer base? And we will pick up on some of those answers later on. Um, So business, Anika. So how do you think you're, you know, you you head ePorsa. How can we recruit, uh, how can businesses recruit a more 
diverse workforce? How can that workforce be recruited and encouraged um, as well to, to apply, etc.? Gosh, we, we have our own diversity issues. So I feel like giving um, <laughs> being the voice on this is um, is worrying. I think, look, we've, we've actually run, we're, we've run quite a few sessions on this recently because it's been front of mind, then gone media in mind, then kind of gone front of mind, then probably gone back. So it's, it's one of those things that's been raised in the consciousness a lot for a lot of people now, um, even if you are as passionate about it as I am in a personal level, I think it's really hard. Um, so what we now do is we, um, I think, I think a lot will depend, and, and this is looking at different businesses. I, I've worked at exclusively male teams before starting this business, um, pretty much for every role that I've had, apart from um, when I was working at Zoopla. So the, the, the lack of diversity from a gender perspective in particular, but also from a race perspective was pretty prevalent there. And learnings from that, which I think have gone into the way that I, I think about ePorter, is um, if, if you're not thinking about it, if you're not aware of your unconscious bias, if you're not reading um, about this and, and it, it, it's not front of mind for you, there's gonna end up being an issue, um, whether you like it or not, because um, as Emma was saying before, you, know, you, you get on with the people that you get on with who are similar to you, you will um, self-select to um, look at people's CVs who are very similar to backgrounds to your own. And so there's just a pattern of behavior that is part of human nature that needs, um, needs um, you to be very conscious of and conscious of um, and getting, getting um, of, of, of um, you know, not falling into a trap essentially. With ePorter, um, what we do is um, we, we, we do a lot of education training within the team now to assess that unconscious bias and so that people are aware of what it is that um, diversity means and um, what it is we did a session or the team did a session the other day on what it means to be an ally within the workforce um, so that you're promoting um, you know not only a diverse workforce but also a happy diverse workforce um, and a huge number of things in that realm that I'm sure Emma can talk to um, given that you run these training sessions as well um, but I do think it's hard and I think it's hard because it relies on you know, hard work and um, hard work in finding the candidates um, in the pool making sure that your hiring practices are good um, and that you do have a diverse pool of candidates for any interview that you're that you're conducting and making sure that you know you, you should always hire the person who's the best qualified for the role but make sure you've got enough people within the hopper so that you're not pigeonholed to a certain group of people um, and that is I have to say it's a difficult activity it's for certain roles in our team for instance um, in particular things that are very um, technology focused um, it's, it's hard to get that candidate pool right um, and we do try our our best but we can always do more um, so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one um, difficult one but there's just just being conscious of it and, and wanting to change and setting up some processes and practices and continuing that and not it not being a blitz when there's a social media storm and then forgetting about it but it being organic and growing over time I think for, for us has been the key thing um, and you know the journey that we're going down yeah, I mean, we've got um, sort of a well, it's a question and uh, from from one of the um, from from one of our viewers here, and uh, she's studying interior design, um, and she's not from this country, um, and she's heard about experiences from designers who are uh, sort of struggling to get. Uh, sort of much visibility and value compared to maybe uh, maybe white British people within design studios um, and sort of what's our take on that I mean I, I mean I'll just sort of say with the United in Design we are going to be placing apprentices into very well established design studios and when and, and part of the sort of um, uh, narrative that we, we're having with these big companies is that you are going to have somebody that's going to walk in here that really does not look like anybody else in your team at right. all so we need to yes they're an apprentice but they need to be work, walking into um, a place that is welcoming and nurturing and you know you need to be uh, talking to your team and, and and I'm sure Emma can touch on this as well and educating your team as well to have somebody who's going to be coming in who's going to be maybe bringing different sort of cultural sort of backgrounds and experiences and things like that um, and 
at the end of the day, we can't change at the moment the landscape of the industry. I would love for some of these apprentices to, to walk in through the door and see somebody that looks like them, but that is not the reality of where we are at the moment. Hopefully in a few years time, it will be different. But I suppose, Amma, what is it that businesses can do to create that inclusive environment then for people such as my apprentices that are going to be going in in January? I think it's, it's an interesting one. I think the question is around culture, right? It's what culture do you want to have that creates the most inclusivity as, a, as you can? And I always take it from the perspective of looking at it from the employee experience, right? So if you almost flip the script and walk the walk as an employee, where are the interventions that need to then be had for them to have a truly inclusive experience? Also, how often do you talk to your employees? How often do you create safe spaces for them to truly give you feedback that you take on board? And once they do that, what do you do with the feedback to show that you're actually actioning stuff around that? In terms of leaders, how are you holding your direct reports accountable to ensure that they are being inclusive leaders in their role and people leaders in that role? Um, I think there's also fundamentally something around not creating something that um, isn't for the people you're creating it for. So my thing is around who's around the tables when these discussions and decisions are being made and actually are they representative of, the, of, of what you're trying to build. Often, unfortunately, in workplaces, you have people that are around the table that are not diverse. And even if they are diverse, they're just there to take a seat and not really input anything or not empowered to say anything. And then you create this thing that nobody likes. You spent lots of money, lots of time and resources, but you've not actually thought about involving the people you're creating it for. In other words, your employees around that. So what often happens is you create these programs, you create these initiatives, you implement all these things and you know you throw all the bells and whistles around them and for the first kind of what couple of days people are on it and then the rest of it they're not even engaging because you've never consulted them in the first place you've never had those focus groups to actually understand where the pressure points and pain points are you've never thought about how to um you know you've never really taken a time out to say okay you've not looked at feedback that's come towards you and you've not made anything about done anything around it we have exit interviews lord knows what people do with those they just kind of go in a deep hole and nobody ever takes notice of them so in order to change your culture you need to think about who that who is creating that culture and the behaviors that are being manifested in that so again if people are experiencing things through microaggressions or through not feeling belonging because there's a lot of cliques or a lot of in groups versus out groups Who's dismantling that? Who's creating that? You know, what are you changing around that? And also, yes, we're talking about an industry that is very saturated and very hard to get into. And unfortunately, it's who you know still in these industries, not what you know or how great you are. So if you are not creating spaces or creating opportunities through internships, making making sure you ring fence a certain amount of numbers in your recruitment process to allow the pipeline through to get through to that recruitment and get hired then you're not you're, you're not doing anything if you're not creating bursaries if you're not doing any of that stuff then you're not going to get the pipeline that you need so i think it will take a long time to stop the whole um it's not who you know but what you know within this industry but you can carve out and start carving out ways for people to come through whether it's through apprenticeships internships etc you know graduate programs mm -hmm. and making sure that your graduate programs you ring fence spaces for people from diverse backgrounds that kind of stuff that you need to really positively start doing and integrating it back in there now and putting those interventions now and holding people accountable so whoever is accountable for delivering that they need to make sure they deliver it and they need to make sure that they're progressing on that and that you know that it impacts their reviews at the end of the year mm -hmm. i mean you can be even so bold to impact their bonus because then people will wake up when you start hitting their wallets and so organisations, I think we've heard a lot, haven't we, about sort of, uh, it's not enough to be not racist, but you need to be anti-racist. And I suppose one of those things is companies who say, oh, gosh, you know, you know, my, my systems are set up, you know, I would never sort of um, not hire somebody who, you know, was from an ethnic minority background. And lots of people don't consider themselves to be um, sort of lacking in maybe diversity and opportunity, but 
how are they are they just not promoting it like how are they almost like resisting diversity without even actually knowing that that's what they're doing with their practices you know how are they essentially not promoting the fact that they welcome a diverse workforce and what can they do to should they be promoting that they want to hear from a more diverse workforce well, it makes me laugh because if you're looking at your diverse person, they're not work diverse, then you clearly are not promoting and you're definitely doing something wrong. So for you to say something and still look around and not see what you're saying, you kind of have to, I guess, stop drinking the Kool-Aid in a sense, in the way that you have to look when we talk about and when we talk about anti-racism and racism, people are going to get uncomfortable. Let's just get that straight. You just need to get uncomfortable to be comfortable. And you probably get on the uncomfortable journey for a while until you get comfortable how soon you get comfortable is depending on how soon you're able to really have that self-awareness and check yourself and understand what you need to do better when it comes to your privilege when it comes to the part that you are playing in this and you make that influence it's it's just it's one of a better word it is that simple it is going to you're going to have to whenever we have to go against the status quo for whatever reason it's going to be a hard ride and a tough ride to do it but we will get there eventually but people have to be real about it you can't be like oh i'm not i'm not i'm not but but there's no there's if you're not then why isn't there a change because if you are there would be change so for me the thing is very much around being really truly brutal and honest about it with about what's going on in your organizations and as individuals if you are truly saying we want to do this but yet you haven't changed anything mm -hmm. You're not going to you're not going to get the achievements, the results. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect things to be different. You can't. So you're going to have to change the way and really look at what is happening and where is where we need to change. So if you do have an organization where you have three percent of people from ethnic minority back, ethnic backgrounds, you need to ask them. <clears throat> what do we need to do differently? But if they don't want to say, you can obviously see why they don't want to say it because there's only 3%. But give them the opportunity to tell you what needs to change and from their experiences and their lived experiences. Now, when they do that, you have to do something. You can't just say thank you very much and just not make change. Companies, by the end of May and beginning of June, were all throwing out their statements of, oh, we are so for solidarity. And I'm still waiting to hear what their action plans are. They've written I, statements, yeah. but there's no action plan to say, this is what we're going to do. And, and then, I think, mm, sorry, sorry, Amma. I mean, just on that point, I mean, this is how, you know, sort of United in Design was born. You know, we saw all of those black squares. We saw the sort of public outcry that was happening. And, you know, it was, okay, let, you know, let's hold you accountable then. Let's hold you accountable. You know, you have said openly that you are disgusted by this and you want to change. So, we knocked on doors and actually the majority of people I think I feel that they they wanted to but they they needed to and they almost had to because you, you can't actually just put that black square on and then not follow that up with 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 action and um, and it's about action it's not about words you know we it has to be tangible action that is taken um and actually we're going to move on to education now and I'm going to bring Julia in um, as our KLC representative. Now Bavin touched on this earlier about creative careers not being understood or promoted within certain cultures um, and those sort of jobs and careers as doctors, lawyers, etc. Those are the careers within, you know, maybe African culture, Asian culture that are promoted and creative, um, creative uh, careers are not. So Julia, um, what steps do you think that design schools can take to increase the numbers of ethnic minority students that you see coming through your doors? And how can we promote a career in um, the design industry uh, to those cultures? Well, I, <clears throat> I think um, Bhavan actually covered it, you know, covered some very good points when he was speaking about not seeing the right faces involved with the industry. So you don't know that there are opportunities within the industry. Um, several years, for several years, we had a partnership with uh, the local councils. So Kensington, Chelsea, Fulham, 
Hammersmith, um, Westminster, and going into local schools um, and working with um, students who were studying for GCSE art um, and design and trying to work with them on a, an interior design project to encourage them to, to know that there were careers available within design practice. But anecdotally, what those students would say to me is, well, my parents want me to be a doctor or my parents want me to be a lawyer. And it comes back to the not seeing on grand designs, the right person, you know, at the front or on, a, you know, the various TV programs that we all watch. Um, so I've, I actually, it's, this is a really interesting conversation for me because we are about to launch a scholarship competition, the purpose of which is, is for widening participation to try to increase diversity within the industry. And we've put together promotional materials and listening to the conversation here this evening, I see some flaws in our promotional materials that I'd like to address. Um, so I think, you know, we, we can improve the perception of those materials as they go into schools so that students see people like them succeeding in the industry. And it seems to me that that's a, that's a really important sort of part of the cycle. So we can certainly work on that. But Alex, I know that um, this educational outreach is an aspect of United in Design, your, your charitable mm -hmm. organization, um, and that we're also hoping that we might be able to run some short courses in association with United in Design, where um, initially we were thinking about, um, again, bringing in younger people who are, haven't yet decided what direction their career is going to take and spend a couple of days with them and show them what interior design is. Um, but also a conversation that you and I were having, um, <laughs> a conversation that you and I were having previously, um, which is that, uh, there are a lot of people who are coming out of the state sector with mm -hmm. their qualification and they don't know how to get into our industry and I think possibly there are some conversion courses some access training that we can give because actually probably the hardest step is to get in you know it's not it's not what you do when you get in it's actually just getting over the threshold in the first place um so yes yeah, short courses um awareness um encouragement um but also taking some lessons away from conversations like these that i think is going to make our material more powerful as a result yeah definitely and i've, I've had some um conversations with um it, it's about having representation uh, when there are design shows and uh, it, and panels um, and, you know, L London De Design Festival and places like that. You know, we need to be seeing a more ethnically diverse um, group of people in magazines, um, promoting events, um, being asked to come and speak. Um, so across the board, because, you know, young people um, who are making those career decisions need to see people that look like them because then they can believe that actually they can achieve something and they can do that. Um, and we are putting together a video at United in Design that's going to go to all of the schools UK wide um, to promote a career in interior design um, and, and sort of give them some, some steps in order to, you know, how can that be achieved? And that's going to go to that sort of year nine, year 10 cohort when they're just on the cusp of trying to decide on their GCSEs and what they're going to be doing, as well as going into schools to deliver talks and workshops and things like that. Because, you know, we need to be capturing them early then we need to be following and creating a pathway so we follow them through their education then when they come out of university and they're looking for that year's worth of experience that foot in the door that all important foot in the door then we've got something there to help them with that as well and then as they're on that journey they need to have that mentor that support system in place somebody to turn to when they need advice or things aren't going well or they just you know so they need to be guided all the way through and given the same opportunities and the same level of support that we see all these amazing design companies that have already set up but actually we need to be giving back uh, to the person who's coming up and I just think that is 
quite frankly, the right thing to do. And we can all play a part in that. You don't have to be um, at, a, at a certain, if you are just one rung up the ladder above somebody else, you've got something to give to that person who's coming up. Um, and it's about giving your time and your expertise um, to somebody and just being there to listen and to guide, I think as well. And, you know, for these companies that are putting money in to this now, and they're actually paying people to train and we're getting rid of this whole free intern thing that has come in you know years before you know people need to live and so therefore it becomes not then as elitist as well because it's not mm. just a case of race it's a it's about not being able to afford to get into this industry as well because most of the design practices are based in London we all know to live here it's incredibly expensive so how on earth could you be expected to survive on either no money or incredibly little money? So we, our apprenticeship scheme, we've, we've said that you all need to pay them £22,000 a year. That is the starting wage, that's a junior starting design salary, that is what they're going to earn. And to be fair, these companies have said, okay, we'll do it, we're, we're gonna pay them, but it shouldn't have taken this to get them to agree to that um but um we'll take it because it's a start <laughs> and we're getting it um, um and so i would yeah sorry i'm just going to say to the audience actually um why do you think the demographics of the wider population are just not being represented within our industry and why you know why are people from ethnic minority backgrounds not wanting to study like what do you think is prohibitive actually to 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 people from those backgrounds um not, not not studying um, and we'll come to some of those answers shortly um alex i might yeah. just in that video yeah, of and you're, you kind of want to send to schools mm -hmm. um i think those schools should be showing that uh video to their kids parents as well yeah mm. because the, yeah. Idea. the fight is with our parents as well not just yeah. the industry yeah. so if we're educating the kids we've got to educate the parents as well that's actually a really good point, Bavin, because I think when I, I think it was when I was at Deloitte, that's one of the things that we needed to make sure we did, because from a cultural context, like you were saying, Alexandra, it's the professional jobs because you are guaranteed. And it's really funny because I was actually on a podcast earlier today when I was being, they asked me about my career. And I remember telling them that I wanted to be a dancer and my dad turned around and told me no because there's no such thing as dancing in Ghana I was like who's going back to Ghana I mean I do go back to Ghana but it was a whole conversation around it's not a career that pays um so I think there's a lot of education because the and it's not parents fault the default is that they want their children to succeed and that is what has been the stereotypical image of success and getting a good career but also getting good reputation behind it incredible reputation behind it. So there's definitely an education system around educating the parents, but also bringing them alongside. So I definitely think having um, whatever open sessions or career talks or parents evenings, so to speak, to invite the parents to come as well to that conversation. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm just, we're just having a look through now. Everyone's just saying, yeah, it looks very white and very middle-class from the outside looking in. So it really does tie back to what we said is that, you know, that people are not seeing people that represent themselves. And so therefore it, it, it makes it feel that it's, it's not inclusive for us, that we don't, you know, we don't belong there. And so this is what's coming through in some of our, um, yeah, and it, the fact that it's very exclusive mm -hmm. and elitist. Yeah. And so I think, you know, in terms of money and things like that as well, um, there isn't that narrative that you can create that beautiful home um with with actually a lot of imagination and creativity and you do not have to have a ridiculously huge budget in order to create that um and i think probably all of us here would agree that everybody deserves to live in a in a beautiful space um irrespective really of of, of how much they've got to, to 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 spend on it you know it can be as simple as just you know changing a wall color um mm. you know working with paint you know that's not expensive but it can really make a huge difference um so i think we need to have that narrative as well is that how can how can interior design be more accessible in terms of uh, to people you know who don't have huge budgets to spend on on projects as well 
Alex, um, some, some of our students, I mean, I would say our students quite broadly, regardless of their background, pretty much all say to us that the industry looks really terrifying from the outside. It's the industry looks terrifying. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there's work to do there as well. Yeah. And, and in fact, we, we talked about that, didn't we, guys, before we came on? It's like, you know, how how is this going to play out? And it's just about being yourself. You know, we're, you know, we're all nice people. We're all, you know, very approachable. And I think, and in fact, I have over the last few months, I'm sure you all have as well, reached out to people and, and started conversations with people. And I've been really surprised at the warmth that's come back. And actually, if you ask, people for help or if you ask them for their advice lots of time they will give you that time it's maybe they've just kind of got this veneer up but but if yeah, you scratch think, the surface sometimes you will you will get a, a positive response but I also think it's just them showing that they're open so you know probably uh, do you know what and now is the time to do it because we're, we're all talking about race equity we're all talking about accessibility and inclusion so I understand why people didn't want to do it before because if an if an industry already looks predominantly non-diverse mm -hmm. and does not look welcoming why would I even bother to go in there mm -hmm. I've been to d design events small design events and I've been the only black woman in that event and often I've walked out because I just cannot be bothered to have conversation. And I've often also, when I walked in, no one's been welcoming to me. They've mm. all been in their little cliques. Mm. So again, why would I want to even think about doing that? Let it um, approaching who, I wouldn't even know who to approach to even have the conversation. So this is what I'm saying is as much as there needs to be accessibility, people need to pay it forward and show that they are available for that. Mm. Um, and, and make sure that people that they that they are welcoming in doing so because I often find where you have niche organizations or niche groups or niche industries the only way you get to get in is by someone introducing you and yeah. also they will only do that if they know that they're getting something out of it mm. and that is yeah. not the, and the that should sorry no, go sorry, ahead Emma. no no no, no, sorry, no. <laughs> no that's I what I'm saying <laughs> Classic. You go, you go. <laughs> um, I was going to say, it's a, as, a, as someone who came in as a bit of an outsider into the industry um, a few years ago, it, it definitely did feel like quite a competitive industry as well. Um, and I think that's fueled people not talking to each other as much as, um, as, much as other industries do, because um, everyone's, you know, not competing for the same work, but, you know, competing, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard role as well to try and find, find the next client and do various things. And also people are just mad busy because everyone works too hard and doesn't have enough hours in the day. Um, so it's, it's actually interesting because I think the last few months have shown that there has been a shift. I felt the shift, um, like what everyone's been saying in terms of people being much more open to talking, not only about race, but just to each other has mm -hmm. been really, really great. Um, and only, you know, with all the momentum that you've got with the charity, um, Alex, and with everything that's happening, hopefully that'll just open up even more. Um, so it does become an industry that is a community as opposed to a siloed group of people kind of doing their own thing. Definitely. Yeah, it needs to open up the doors. Yeah. You know, we need to open up the doors for there to be long lasting, tangible change, yeah. you know, um, and that needs to happen now. And, and in fact, that leads us really on to this question of the, the conversation that we're having tonight. I mean, we're, we're talking about this quite openly and quite easily. But this is not a comfortable conversation for a lot of people to have. Um, and so I'm going to ask the audience again, do you feel comfortable having conversations about diversity? Yes or no? You know, you've probably had lots of conversations in the last few months with people about this issue. How has that been for you? Um, and so we need to talk about this, don't we? We need to keep this narrative going. We need to be talking about this, as you say, in organisations. Uh, companies need to be looking at the diversity policies. We need to be, as you say, talking to members of staff, um, getting proper training in place and things like that. So, you know, what large or small steps can we all take to create and be part of a more sort of diverse and inclusive future coming to bath in on that? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it's it might seem like a small step but it may seem like a massive step to some people but you have to come forward and talk like i've reached out to pretty much every major magazine since the whole you know black square day that happened and i basically just wrote to them saying you need to make better effort at putting our faces there and some people responded some people still to this day haven't responded which I think it's a little rude, but it is what it is. Um, but it's okay to respond and have a little conversation about it. But where's the, what have you done about it? Because I'm still not seeing it. You know, these magazines get printed every month. And yeah, I know they work three months in advance, but they can shift things around quickly. They're not printing until like the week before they go to print. So what are they actually doing? um because it's really easy to talk about things but your actions are much louder and like i'm very forward you know i'm okay to talk about it and i'm okay to offend people and i'm okay to kind of rock the boat and i get a lot of people scared to do that but they can't be scared to do that and then complain that it's not a diverse industry you've got to kind of step up and put yourself out there because if we don't then it's never gonna change and it's still gonna stay the same. People will be moaning about the same thing. All the people that put those black squares on will have forgotten about it because they'll be jumping onto the next fad that is that day. And, you know, it's really frustrating, but Instagram does rule the creative industry. Mm. And there's a lot of people with a voice out there and yes, they all put the black square on, but what have they done after that? It's not enough just putting a black square. You fight with us just as hard as we are, and then we'll kind of appreciate what you're doing for us. And the new lot. Yeah. I'm seeing that lots of people are quite comfortable actually having this conversation. Some are not in a sort of work employment situation just because they're concerned about sort of uh, the, the sort of repercussions of that. Um, and lots of people sort of saying they feel that it's prohibitive because of money, actually. And that um, to, as, as we touched on earlier, you know, some training, uh, some programs are expensive to train, to live in the capital, to support yourself whilst you're training on relatively like low wages and things. Um, so that is what's coming through on the chat. Um, I think, I think yeah. that's an interesting one, Alexandra, because I think definitely businesses and companies and organizations need to do more but so does the government mm -hmm. because it is very much an elitist industry just like some others out there and if we don't and I'm with you on that Bevan as well I think people should find the courage and be brave enough to speak up there's definitely ways of doing that um, and creative and different ways to do that but also equally companies need to listen and do something different about it and governments need to help and if it's, it's because it's such a, um, I guess it's because it's such, um, it's very much around elitism and very much around class and very much with that comes with eco-socioeconomic -social elements of it. So mm -hmm. there needs to be things around how we can have bursaries and subsidized courses for people that really want to have a talent to be able to get into the industry from the accessibility route. But I also think some industries were created because others stopped wanting to get a seat around the table and created their own. So again, I get it. It's a very tough industry to crack. It's really still predominantly dominated by those that have influence and, and money. But I'd like to hope and glimmer and think that because there's other mediums and channels, whether it's social media, entrepreneurship, you can start creating those spaces for yourselves too to start forming your own communities, your own kind of, um, I don't know, market spaces. And the reason why I'm saying that is that organizations like Depop um, that are changing the fashion industry and the way people shop by having online markets for people. And they are quite diverse marketers in those, in, in, in their, on the, using their platforms to sell their fashion, their own clothes and their own. So this is what I'm saying, it's like, still hammer at the, I guess, hammer at the uh, walls, 
but also create your own spaces and look for entrepreneurs and um, investors that would invest, angel investors that will invest in your businesses and ideas to help you give that springboard to get there. And that's what I would add to that. Um, Cause I think sometimes you just have to be like, I'm, I'm done. I need to do my, I need to go and create my own table here. Don't burn any bridges because yes, there will be some synergies, but don't wait either. Like, and I think this is, this is the time to do that is now. I mean, I think we've seen over the last, sorry, I think what we've seen over the last um, few months where lots of people weren't putting their, their pictures on social media, uh, they weren't putting their fake pictures on their website because they thought it would be divisive. Now, people have started to come forward um, and we are seeing lots of uh, black and uh, ethnic minority interior designers, the majority of which actually own their own companies and started on their own because they didn't find opportunities within these larger companies. Um, because as you said, they, they, they've got fed up and they just decided to start on their own. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. For that. It's exactly what I did. Um, and and I, I, I love my job. Um, but I will say as well, what I would love to see in a few years time is opportunities for people to train with the best, to be yeah. trained by the best, to get that foot in the door and to establish yourself there. And then in a few years time, you then go off having that amazing experience and training and you start your own company. You can start your own firm. You know, you can be as big as all of these interior designers that we're seeing, but you need to be given the opportunities and the doors need to be open to you and the training needs to be available to you and the education needs to be available to you. But there is no reason why in a few years time when people come to me and they say, I've got a panel discussion, who can I ask to be on the panel so I can make it more diverse? And even I'm sort of scratching my head and going, okay, well, we can only, because people need to be there because they deserve to be there. Nobody wants to be the token person on the panel, but we need to work our way through to get to this level where it's just rolling off the tongue. It's like, we can have this person, this person, this person, mm -hmm. this person. Yeah, and it's just it's just a norm. It's not even something that you really need to think about. So that's what we need to create. We need to get people at the table and and give them the opportunities. And yeah. to round up, because we're running over time, because we could probably chat all night. Um, recommendations from you all um, about how we can sort of further educate ourselves on this subject, because I think this is key. This is the, we need education. Um, books podcasts where can we go to find out more about this where can businesses go to find more Amma, you might be the person for yes. this one um before i say that i actually want to say i keep seeing things popping up in terms of the chat box and the person that keeps talking about age i hear you and i see you and i, and I agree i think especially with this industry i know we're talking a lot about race because unfortunately it is very much an elitist industry which actually when you talk about elitism you talk about class and when you look at class it automatically dissects into race. So um, I hear and I agree. I think age is also another thing that needs to be looked at in this industry and actually most industries because you get to a certain point and suddenly you're, you need to be, you, you've passed your sell by date and you can't do anything anymore where there's actually such a knowledge and plethora of learning that you can, can do from that. So I think that also should be taken into account. So it's not that we're not addressing that. I don't think it's important, I definitely do. But I think in terms of education, we live in a day and age where you just need to type in a Google search to find everything you need. You might need to fact check some things, yes, but you can do that. You, we live in a day and age where there are so many um, things you can learn, books, Audible, like you said, podcasts, movies, films, you know, Netflix, for, for want of a better word, <laughs> is, you know, what I quite like about Netflix is it's opened up a different genre where you can actually go and see such diverse, di diverse programming and, mo and films and documentaries where you could never get in the terrestrial channels or even cable. So I think that is one way about doing it. I think also to stepping out of your comfort zone to what well, you can't now because Early restrictions are happening so you can't go mingling and meet up people like you used to be but there's virtual hangouts 
you know, there's virtual meetups where you can go and meet people from just diverse um, groups of people that have an interest in interior design or have a passion for it, have their own businesses. Integrate yourself, get to know what those are like. Join. There's lots of online communities now you can join and be a part of and learn and, and network. You know, there's lots of ways you can educate virtually or in person, although you have to do distancing, <laughs> social distancing applies. But that's what I'm saying is like, you can, if I just feel we're in a day and age where digital technology enables us to no longer be ignorant. And that's a choice if you want to be ignorant because there are ways in which you can even by your immediate circles, ask, I'm, like you said, Alexandra, I'm looking for somebody, can somebody help me? I'm looking for this, you know, LinkedIn. There's lots, there's just lots of communities in the platform. So for me, I think that it's about doing the research, looking and, and finding out ways of who you can tap into people and being very diverse and actually, you know, go out of your comfort, like I said, go out of your, your normal kind of comfort zone of learning. Read about people that you probably wouldn't know heard of. Go and, and look and, and look for recommendations. It's all at a touch of a button on your mobile phone and your laptop and in this community now. So there is no real excuse. And I think as well, you know, and, and obviously with ePorter and everything as well, I was talking to somebody, it's about suppliers as well and who we're using. I think as interior designers, you you build up a relationship with suppliers and makers and everything. And, and you know, it is a service driven industry and, you know, you're really mindful about giving really good service to your clients, etc. So sometimes you don't go out of your comfort zone of who you're using, but we need to. We actually do need to. We need to be actively seeking out new suppliers, new mm -hmm. makers, Yep. who come from um, ethnic minority backgrounds and we need to be putting them at the forefront and saying, actually, I'm going to give you a chance because if we don't give them a chance, they're never going to um, in advance um, in their own careers and they're never going to be able to advance their own um, companies. So I think that's something we didn't um, sort of touch on today, but I think that's a really important point as well. It kind of goes back as well that people need to give us a chance as well. Mm -hmm. 100%. We're all a team. And we want to help other people, but other people need to help us as well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you uh, to everybody. I think that's been um, a really positive conversation, actually. I think it's a, it, it's a tough subject um, and quite an emotive subject. Uh, we're all coming here with different experiences and perspectives. Um, but, you know, I think the overriding feel of this is that you know we we need to take action we need to move forward we need to be positive in our in in our action taking um and and just help help other people yeah. does you know from whatever background just be helpful and just be kind and just treat other people as you would want to be treated because everybody deserves to succeed um and actually you could be the difference a really small act just you know being there at the end of the phone or responding to somebody if they email you you know just out of courtesy that could make a huge difference to somebody so I think and we can all do that it doesn't cost anything so um thank you everybody thank you thank you thanks Alex brilliant thank you thank have you. a lovely evening everyone <laughs> yes uh, thanks, nice to, to, thanks to everybody for um uh, participating as well um, it's been great to see all the comments coming in and um, you know let's continue the conversation you know let's uh, all kind of follow each other and you know reach out and yeah let's continue it on definitely <laughs> bye. Bye. bye bye